Hi there, my name is Perry, and welcome to the Literary Niterary. Alright friends, so today I will be filming the Rumors book tag originally created by the channel Knox Reads, which I will link in the description down below. Uh, I was tagged by Kelsey from Kelsey Reads, who I will also link in the description down below. So this tag is based around the album Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. Um, I have to say that it was not an album I had ever listened to like as an album until I was preparing to do this tag, although I obviously know and like a lot of the songs from it just because they play on the radio, but the way that I listen to music is weird and not a conversation that we need to have right now. Um, but with all of that said, this I think is the first time that anyone has ever tagged me in anything. Um, so I found that really exciting and wanted to do the tag anyway. <laughs> if you want a little bit more discussion of the songs themselves, uh, definitely check out the original tag video by Knox Reads. Again, that'll be linked in the description below um, because she knows more about the songs than I do, certainly. All right, so question one is secondhand news, an opening line that sets the tone perfectly. And my first thought was Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, which has a very famous first line, which is last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again, which does a really good job of setting up both the sort of dark and sort of almost creepy or dreamlike tone of a lot of the book and the importance of Manderley as both a place and a symbol within the book. For those of you who don't know, Rebecca is a modern classic in the sort of tradition of the gothic novel or like young girl old house stories, um, where a young girl marries a much wealthier and older man who had previously been married. So the rest of the book is sort of about the servants and everyone around her comparing her to her husband's late wife um, and the mystery surrounding the first wife's death. So question two is dreams, a book that you absolutely flew through. And there could honestly be a variety of answers for this question because especially during this past sort of quarantine season, I've been reading a lot of books in one sitting. But I wanted to mention a book that in addition to the objective fact that I did read it in one day or one sitting, also was very um, suspenseful and compelling and felt unputdownable. It felt like I had to keep reading, like I couldn't wait to turn the pages. So in addition to the fact that I didn't take a long time to read this book, The Grace Here by Kim Leggett did keep me turning the pages as fast as I could to figure out what was going to happen next. This is a sort of feminist dystopian young adult novel where uh, the year that they're 16, all of the girls in this town are sent out to the woods um, because it's believed that they are magic when they are that age and that they need to sort of get the magic out so that they can come back and integrate in society as someone's wife. And so it's basically about these girls in the wilderness trying to survive the elements and each other. Question number three is never going back again. What is a book that you don't think you're going to give a second chance to? And for this, I think my answer is going to be The Girls by Emma Klein. In the past, I haven't really tracked my DNFs, so it was hard to come up with one for this. Um, but this was a book that I saw a lot uh, the summer that I worked in a public library, uh, which was the summer of 2016. And then this past summer while I was hiking the Appalachian Trail, I tried to read it and it went back to the library before I finished it. And in contrast to other things that I accidentally didn't finish while I was on the trail, I don't feel pulled to return to it. Basically, from what I remember, this is a dual timeline novel about a young woman who sort of gets sucked into joining a cult and her reflecting on that experience many years later as an adult. From what I remember, this book had a very sort of strong flavor to its writing, and it's a flavor that I'm sure was intentionally and skillfully crafted. It just wasn't a flavor that I particularly liked. Um, and I don't think I made it even far enough into the book to get to the real inciting incident uh, where things would have started picking up speed, so I didn't get hooked into it. Um, so I don't feel any particular yearning to return to the book at this point in time. Question number four is Don't Stop, and that is the next bookish milestone you are looking forward to. Um, for this one, I just hit my Goodreads goal uh, last week, I think. So I'm excited for this year to be the first year since I started tracking my reading that I read 100 books. Um, I think that'll be very doable considering I've already read about 80 books. Question five is Go Your Own Way, a fan favorite that has special meaning for you. And for this, I'm thinking about If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio, which is an adult dark academia novel set in a uh, conservatory Shakespeare acting program at sort of a prestigious college. Obviously, I know this isn't universally a favorite. It's actually a pretty controversial book with a lot of people who really like it and a lot of people who really don't like it. I really liked it, but in addition to sort of meeting it where it is and seeing all of the good things that it's doing, in my opinion, I also think this book is special to me because it so closely resembles a book that I'm currently trying to write. So I'm currently working on a book that is set in a college theater department and is supposed to have sort of a dark tone. 
Um, and a lot of the ideas that I was having and had written down before I read If We Were Villains took place in If We Were Villains. The sort of central premise of my book involves a sort of complicated love shape and a sort of revenge plot as a result of it, um, and that both of those elements are very present in If We Were Villains. Obviously I'm not trying to recreate If We Were Villains in the book that I'm writing, and it honestly might have been a little too close to home to be helpful, but it was a very inspiring thing to read because it showed me how good the kind of book I'm trying to write could be, and how much someone could connect to it. So I think a lot of people find If We Were Villains a sort of fun or interesting read, but I also found it very personally inspiring with regards to this piece of art, this personal project that I was already working on. Question number six is Songbird or a Comfort Read, and for that I have to pick Dancing Shoes by Noelle Streetfield. Um, I think I got this from a Goodwill. I know it's part of a series, but I've never read the other books in the series. So I read this as a kid, and then all throughout growing up, all through high school, whenever I was sick or wasn't feeling well, I would reread this book. It's a middle grade, so it really, it can be reread in a day, and so I've probably read this book upwards of 10 times, like easily. Um, I've been meaning to read the rest of the books in the series to see if they're sort of as adorable as this one. Um, this is about two sisters who are orphaned and taken in by their aunt, um, and their aunt runs a dancing school, so they start to be educated at this dancing school, and one of them is very talented in dancing, and the other one wants her to be like a prima ballerina because that was what their mother wanted before she died, um, but that sister, Hillary, doesn't have the sort of temperament or the discipline to become a prima ballerina. It's never been her dream. Meanwhile, the other sister, Rachel, is terrible at dancing and doesn't get along in her new environment at all, but does sort of have a secret hidden talent for acting. And it's just a really sweet book about sisters learning to accept each other for who they are. I haven't reread this in a couple of years, but I can't think of a book that has replaced it in terms of something I can always turn to when I want a comforting read, other than like the works of Jane Austen or like the entire genre of romance. Um, I guess that's what I go for now, but I've been meaning to reread this and check out the rest of the series because it did bring me a lot of joy and comfort as I was growing up. Okay, question number seven is the chain, something that disappoints you but that you can't break away from. And this is the question I've had the hardest time coming up with an answer for. So I guess the only thing I can think of is sort of bad bookish habits that I have, like the habit of when there's an author that I know I wanna check out, I'll pick up their very first book regardless of whether I'm interested in that book because I like I'm operating under the assumption that I'm gonna read their whole published catalog. Uh, and then I read that first book and I'm like, well, it's okay. And I have no idea whether I really like the author or not because their first book is so seldom their best book. And then I'm like, I can't even draw a conclusion from that. So I've, no I've learned nothing, really. Another similar bad habit that I think sets me up for disappointment is picking up books based on hype, picking up books that it feels like everyone in the booktube community has read uh, and wanting to read them just because they're popular and not because I'm particularly interested in them. And to some extent, I think it's important and valuable to be knowledgeable about popular books if what you're trying to do is be a reader's advisory resource where you tell people oh, you would like this. Um, so if they come in and say, I love Lee Bardugo, what should I read? I'll be like, I don't know, I've never read Lee Bardugo, but I know that when I read Lee Bardugo, I'm going to start with the first book she ever published and I'm not going to like it. So I might stop reading the first book in an author's published catalog as a means of judging them, but I'm probably not gonna stop reading hyped books because again, I think it's valuable to be able to talk about them, to be able to have an opinion on a book that a lot of people have read. Question number eight is You Make Loving Fun, a character that makes love and fun. Um, and for this, I wanted to mention Well Met by Jen DeLuca, which was, is one of my favorite romances that I've read this year, if not my favorite. Um, and it is set largely at a Renaissance fair. And so both of the characters, whose names I believe are Simon and Emily, flirt with each other using the Ren Fair as sort of an excuse, which makes it a lot of fun. They flirt with each other in character a lot, or they flirt by arguing about Shakespeare, which is just adorable and funny and fun. Question number nine is, I don't want to know, pick up the two books that are closest to you and choose one to get rid of and one to save. Um, as you can see, a lot of books are sort of equidistant from me right now, so I'm going to close my eyes and turn around and grab two at random, and hopefully that satisfies the spirit of the prompt. Okay, so we got we have um, I Robot by Isaac Asimov and Ragtime by E. L. Doctorow, and this is a pretty easy choice because this one is my boyfriend's. Uh, we share bookshelves. This one's my boyfriend's, uh, and this one I bought for myself to read 
so I'm gonna save this one. I'm interested in reading more Asimov over the course of my life, but this has also been turned into a musical and comparing books with the musicals made based on them is sort of a hobby of mine, so yeah, I bought this one for myself, so I'm gonna keep it. So question 10 is, oh daddy, a book that you and your friends do not agree on. First of all, bold of you to assume that I have friends. I think my pick for this is Into the Wild by John Krakauer. So I don't want to malign anyone if I'm incorrect, but I'm pretty sure my boyfriend and his sister both really like this book, and a lot of people that I've talked to within the general sort of outdoor hiking, camping, backpacking community really like this book. I detested this book. Um, I read this book my junior year of high school for my AP language and composition class and it was maybe the only book I was assigned to read in high school that I did not like and definitely was the book I was assigned to read in high school that I liked the least. So I have so many problems with this book that I could <laughs> make an entire rant review about it um, and it would be long but <laughs> basically um, in broad strokes this is a book about a young man who gave away all of his stuff, gave away all of his money um, right after he graduated college and ghosted his whole family and went to like go live in the outdoors unfettered by the constraints of modern society or whatever. Um, and eventually and tragically uh, died of starvation or poisoning or something in a bus in the Alaskan wilderness. As I mentioned, I have a lot of problems with this book, but to tr sort of try to go over them quickly, John Krakauer abandons, destroys, obliterates any claim he could possibly have had to journalistic integrity within this ostensibly non-fiction book, because from the very beginning of the book, he is so clearly a Chris McCandless fanboy, so clearly wants to identify with McCandless. So that's frustrating. It makes it difficult to take anything that happens in the rest of the book seriously. Meanwhile, I'm supposed to be accepting this guy as a hero of like pure um, idealism who was unwilling to compromise his morals by like participating in society. So he just like left. And I'm supposed to think that's a really good thing, a really brave thing to do. But what it seems like to me is an incredibly selfish thing to do. I think if he were a woman or a person of color, we, he would, we would not be lauding him as a paragon of individualism, idealism, integrity. We would be complaining that he left his family in the lurch, that he didn't tell them what was happening to him, and that that makes him neglectful and selfish and bad. Um, and I'm 90% sure that he would have encountered violence at some point along this journey. So the fact that he's able to do it at all and that John Krakauer is able to hold it up as an example, like it's something we should aspire to, are both examples of extreme societal privilege. Finally, my largest pet peeve with it, as someone who has dropped out of society effectively for six months, to hike the Appalachian Trail, I was getting really frustrated by the fact that I felt so totally disconnected from things like activism and movements for social change and progress. I felt like something was missing in my life because I wasn't giving back to anybody in any way. I wasn't involved in a community. I wasn't trying to make life better for those around me. Um, we'll never know whether McCandless would have eventually returned to society or not, but especially after having taken my own similar adventure into the wild, I feel like any person who would abandon society permanently rather than working to change it is fundamentally a selfish person and not someone to be celebrated. I feel like I should reread this book. Um, I feel like it could fit in with my Through Hiker series as well. I mean, and I could call the video any number of things, including like rereading my least favorite book. Um, but I don't want to reread it because it was my least favorite book. And I'm including it for this question because I know a lot of people like it and I hate it with every fiber of my being. Question number 11 is Gold Dust Woman, a relationship that ruins love for you. And for this, I couldn't think of anything from like a romance book or a young adult book where you're supposed to be shipping the couple and I just really didn't. I didn't want them to be together or I hated one of them or I thought that they were doing toxic things to each other or whatever. I couldn't think of anything where I was supposed to ship the couple and didn't. But I did think of Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn though because of that idea at the beginning and end of the book about how like you can never really tell what 
your partner is thinking. You'll never know for a fact what they're thinking, what's going on inside of another person's head. And that sort of idea of the like impenetrability, the inability of us to fully communicate, to perfectly communicate from one consciousness to another has been something that I have been thinking about a lot over years. Um, and you know, I always come to the conclusion that like it's worth trying anyway, even though we'll never communicate perfectly. But the fact that a person that you're in a relationship with could be thinking anything and you would not know is it and I guess an insecurity that you could have in a relationship that you don't truly know how your partner feels you only know how, what they say and how they act and you have to sort of guess based on that because you're never going to feel what they're feeling that's all that's it I, I don't know I don't know question 12 is silver springs a perfect ending um and for this one I had a couple of picks First of all, I wanted to mention uh, The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager, which is the first time that I read a thriller that does a really sort of last minute twist that I didn't hate and actually, in fact, rather enjoyed. Um, obviously, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's one of those sort of like last page, last two pages twist that's supposed to just leave you going, what, when the book is over? Usually, it's too crazy for me, the last minute twist. Um, like in a Sherry Lapina book, I don't like that. I don't like those last minute twists, but this one, the last minute twist worked pretty well for me. And then the other book I wanted to mention that has something about the ending that I really liked was Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. And again, I don't want to spoil what it is that's happening, but basically, uh, also warning, this is a pandemic book. This is a, a book about a flu that kills a huge percentage of the world's population and basically collapses societal structures as we know them. Um, but basically, there's a scene at the very end of the book where the main character sees something that humanity has been working on rebuilding and that moment just really hit me it made me cry it was just a beautiful moment of humanity persisting despite all obstacles despite all of our flaws and failings it was a really beautiful closing image for the book so question number 13 is Rhiannon what is your favorite retelling uh, and for this I think I want to talk about Longborn by Joe Baker which is a retelling of Pride and Prejudice but told from the position of the servants who work at Longborn which is Lizzie Bennett's family home basically um, just does a really interesting job of retelling the novel from a different perspective um, especially because so much of the surviving literature that we have from that time period and so much of the literature that has since been inspired by Jane Austen and her contemporaries focuses exclusively on the wealthy, um, ignoring the middle and lower classes entirely, and tends to idealize the wealthy without commenting on the ways that their accumulated wealth relies on the exploitation of others. So in general, I think Longborn does good and important work by pointing out that there is a huge group of people whose history we don't hear told as frequently as the history of the wealthy and powerful. And also it's just a good and enjoyable book in its own right. And finally, question 14 is The Chain Demo, an underrated favorite book. Uh, and for this, I have two I wanna talk about. First up is In Other Lands by Sarah Reese Brennan, which is a young adult portal fantasy that is a very loving parody of a lot of the tropes of young adult portal fantasy and the young adult age category in general. Um, so it has like a love triangle, but maybe not the love triangle that you would expect. And it has a very sort of grumpy, grouchy main character learning to believe that he is worthy of love. The main character identifies as bisexual on the page. And it is a just a really sweet story that sort of lovingly plays with the things that are admittedly pretty silly about young adult fantasy. So I really recommend that one, and I feel like I don't see a lot of people talking about it. And the other one is Villette by Charlotte Bronte, which is underrated insofar as comparison to Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, which is like hugely popular, gets adapted and readapted over and over again, is a lot of people here on Booktube's favorite book of all time, is one of my favorite books of all time, but nobody talks about Villette. And Villette is amazing. Um, Villette is a bit of a more melancholy, complicated novel with a more melancholy and complicated protagonist than Jane Eyre, but it is definitely really enjoyable and rewarding to read and to study. So if you liked Jane Eyre and you've never read any other Charlotte Bronte, may I recommend Villette? Anyway, I have had Don't Stop stuck in my head the entire time that I've been filming this. Despite the fact that I do not know anything about either of these people's taste in music, I'm going to tentatively tag the channel Stella Bzzz and also uh, Ellie's Little Library. I'll link both of them in the description down below. But for anybody else who, like me, had not been tagged in anything up until this point, you can consider yourself tagged from this video if you so desire. But yeah, that should be it for today. Um, if there is anything bookish that routinely disappoints you but that you can't seem to break up with, let me know what that is in the comments down below. 
below. If you had a good time here, I hope you will consider subscribing and I will see you again soon. Until then, I hope that everybody is staying happy, healthy, and safe. And I hope that somewhere out there, there is a great book waiting just for you. Bye.